Good evening. Welcome to our History, Theology, and Philosophy lecture series. I'm John Hamer. We're streaming live here from Toronto Center Place. Uh, this is an interactive presentation. Um, we're listening in the chats on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, Leandro is acting as our producer here tonight, and he will be uh, following those and compiling those uh, questions that you have and comments, and we'll be able to have a Q&A session following the formal lecture. I always remind you that you can view our entire catalog of lectures that keeps growing at our website, centerplace.ca slash lectures. And we invite you always to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, it's free to do that and uh, new content is regularly added. I want to announce the next couple of lectures. So uh, next Tuesday on November 22nd, um, we're going to explore uh, the lost Gospels of the Hebrews. So um, what are these? So as you probably know, there's all kinds of uh, Christian, early Christian writings that didn't make it into the New Testament, that were not canonized. And in a lot of cases, this is because it uh, were, was written by or it had um, elements in it where they were the scriptures essentially of Christian groups that didn't become the main line of the church, that weren't the proto-Orthodox, the uh, people who eventually became uh, Nicene Christianity, and instead uh, were other groups, and specifically in this case what we're looking at is uh, groups that continued to follow Jewish law. So um, all of the original uh, disciples of Jesus were uh, Jewish, and it's only long after his death that uh, Christianity completely diverges from uh, Judaism. But for many, many centuries afterwards, there were some groups of Christians that continued to keep kosher, to uh, insist that they need to be they need to be circumcised, following different uh, elements of Mosaic law and so forth. Um, and so they had at least maybe three gospels that uh, have now been lost that we have fragments of. So the Gospel of Hebrews, the Gospel of the Nazorians, and the Gospel of the Ebionites. And so even though those are lost, um, fragments remain, uh, specifically usually by uh, Orthodox and Proto-Orthodox writers who have copies of it or are quoting them in order to disparage uh, groups that they consider heretics. But anyway, it's going to be an interesting topic and that will be next Tuesday. Um, the next Tuesday we're going to take a break for American Thanksgiving, uh, but the following week on December 6th, we're going to go back to our Who Was uh, in the New Testament series that we've been doing all of this year. Uh, we've looked at different figures who are uh, likely to have been historical figures, and one of these is uh, John the Baptist, who's kind of an interesting character. Um, the way the uh, uh, Gospels begin Jesus' ministry in, um, in the New Testament uh, Jesus begins by being baptized by this figure, John the Baptist, and in the um, essentially in the Christian accounts, the accounts that are in the Christian Gospels, uh, John has actually been looking forward to Jesus. So John considers himself to be less than Jesus, and so forth. Um, however, many um, literary critics, scholars of uh, history, when they look at uh, how uh, the Christian apologetics develop seem to say that they think that this is probably hiding a historical reality that was embarrassing to early Christians, which is that Jesus was actually originally a disciple of John the Baptist. Uh, in any event, uh, John the Baptist did, did have disciples of his own. Those disciples continued to uh, be, revere him as a, a prophet, as a martyr, after his death. And indeed, it's completely possible um, that some of John's disciples have continued on to this day and have become the Mandaean religion, and so we'll look at that. Uh, very interesting um, religion, uh, it's facing enormous persecution right now, uh, that, has, that reveres uh, John the Baptist as one of its core uh, leaders it looks back to. But we'll look in general at the historical figure of John the Baptist and the influence uh, that he may have, ha seems to have had on, on the emergence of Christianity. 
Our lectures are all listener supported. If you'd like to make a contribution, you can do so again at our website, centerplace.ca slash donate. Our topic tonight, uh, I called it before when we were first um, uh, setting up the lectures in the past, I called it a history of marriage. Um, when I went to researching this and read some articles and books and so forth on the topic, um, I started to realize this is a much more monumental, uh, way too broad a title uh, than what I would be really able to accomplish in a single evening. And so probably this should be retitled now, something more like my um, reflections on traditional marriage in the Western tradition. So um, it's not going to be anything where near so broad as a history of marriage, which means we can go back to this topic and, and look at more of the diversity of marriage and also more ancient forms than what I'm going to look at um, primarily from the Greco-Roman Jewish and Christian traditions. Um, but in any event, that's what the idea of it tonight will be. So weddings uh, are, you know, an important genre actually of an entire film genre. So I think that there is now more um, and certainly more popular uh, wedding style movies uh, than there are, for example, westerns, which used to be one of the, the major um, genres in, in film in the past when there's still some westerns, but they're not anywhere near, I think, as many as there are all of these um, wedding and bride and marriage <laughs> films and so forth. Um, and I just highlighted a couple of the ones that I could think of here, and I pulled them, then I kind of did another Google search and just asked. There's actually, according to Google anyway, multiple wedding genres because there are wedding dramas, there are wedding comedies, and then there are wedding love movies, wedding, wedding, wedding. People um, like to think about and fantasize about, have very romantic ideas about weddings, and even, um, even when the whole movie isn't entirely focused on marriages and weddings and so forth. Uh, a wedding episode is, is a, a, often a big deal in a, just a regular series. You know, somehow they, they refresh it or they want to think you're going to refresh it by having a big wedding scene or something like that. So weddings are a big deal in our entertainment, in our literature, in romance, in their sort of, we have an obsession with the idea of them, I think, in the West. Um, of course, the culmination of many fairy tale stories uh, right before we get to the part where they said, and they lived happily ever after, um, it's when they have their wedding. So here Prince Charming and Cinderella are getting married right uh, before the end of that uh, Disney animated classic movie. I get it. it conveniently leaves out um, the what married life actually may, may have been like <laughs> and so on. Obviously this are in this case, it can become a royal family of whatever kingdom Prince Charming is from. Um, but um, I don't know, as we see from the, if you're watching, like many of us, uh, The Crown right now, and are reliving essentially the, the fairy tale, what originally seemed like a fairy tale wedding of Princess Diana and Prince Charles, um, the happily ever after doesn't always accompany uh, even a royal uh, fairy tale wedding. So, weddings have also become quite an expensive tradition. Um, in the US, in 2021, apparently the average cost of a wedding, if you add up everything, including the ceremony and the reception, was $28,000. Um, and wedding industries seemingly are thriving in contrast to the funeral industry, where the average cost of a funeral is $7,000. I think one of the things that's happening as um, people are not as comfortable with death, but also I think that the tradition of wanting to be buried and having a big coffin and having a, a tombstone and things like that in the West is on the wane. Um, people are much more likely to be cremated at this point, which is obviously much less expensive than buying. I mean, you still might have a big coffin and things like that, but a lot of times you don't have to have, and that obviously brings that whole component of it down. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening with marriages, obviously, when you get to an average like twenty-eight thousand um, dollars, a lot of ten thousand dollar weddings are are being having their average brought up by a couple million dollar weddings and so forth. But they're um, in that attempt that some people are having to live out um, one of these movie 
uh, romantic visions of what weddings should be, um, that's driving the average cost up as the industry uh, allows you to do just about anything you would want to do and to make it like a movie experience. So because of that pressure, that sense, maybe because of all these movies, because of peer pressure and all these other things, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, newly engaged couples were surveyed over two recent years. They indicated that they felt that they were forced to delay marrying uh, due to that high cost of weddings. Um, so one of the reasons why I was thinking about this is that I actually, as a pastor, have been able to be an efficient at weddings, and we just recently um, had an absolutely uh, wonderful wedding uh, where I was able to help marry um, two wonderful friends, they, uh, two women who were, had been in a couple, uh, been in a relationship for uh, many, many years, and they were, have been living together as an unmarried couple, raising children, having a very committed, loving relationship. Um, and they decided that they wanted to have an, a, a wedding ceremony in order to uh, formalize and, and legalize the relationship in, a, you know, in another level. In Canada, there's actually fairly, um, fairly significant common law marriage that they already would have been um, understanding or already would have been have living, but now they're having that additional layer of an actual legal marriage contract and so on. And it was actually, I don't think, I wouldn't say it was an extremely expensive service. It was done in their backyard, which was beautiful, and they had a wonderful party afterwards and a dinner and, and uh, all their family and relatives and things like that. But it was, anyway, it was lovely and wonderful, but without being extravagant and overly costly. So that, one of the things about that has caused me to reflect on weddings. Um, I've been able to, I'm also going to be doing another several next summer um, for family members and other people who I've known, and I'm excited for that. Um, anyway, I'll just mention that before becoming a pastor, I've also had a bunch of other jobs at weddings that I've enjoyed. So I've been the best man, and I've given uh, best man speeches, and I like doing that. I think I'm a fairly good speech maker, and I've also served as the MC of a wedding, my sister's wedding. Um, I've also served several times in uh, my favorite job, which was second best man, where you don't actually have to do anything <laughs> except stand next to the best man and help him out if he, if he falls, fails to do something. So let's look at the elements of the Western wedding tradition. So according to tradition, so let's try to spell these out. You're probably very familiar with all of these because of all the movies and having been to them yourself and so forth. The male partner in a heterosexual relationship proposes marriage to the female partner on bended knee in a suitably romantic setting. He may have already asked her father for permission. I don't know if that's done as much anymore, but anyway, this is the tradition is what we're saying as we're remembering it and as it actually is played out in in romantic movies and so forth. Um, when you're later together as a couple because of the, uh, again, pressure of this whole wedding background as part of your narrative as a married couple, um, the way you propose is sometimes has to, is, has to be very creative because it becomes part of your like lifelong uh, how, you, how did you get married story and so forth. It becomes part of the narrative. Um, that engagement traditionally includes a diamond ring, which is, I'm sure, helping keep the whole diamond industry going. The average cost of an engagement ring in 2022 was $6,000, and so that's, you know, that's more, that's not, was not included before when I was talking about the cost of wedding and reception and so forth, because essentially the engagement period and the honeymoon period, that's additional cost. Um, prior to the wedding, there's bridal showers, and bachelor parties, there are uh, wedding rehearsals, rehearsal dinners. In the traditional ceremony itself, when the day of the wedding comes, um, there's a bunch of superstitions but, and other kinds of traditions that go along with it, not seeing the bride and so forth, but the bride uh, traditionally wears a white dress with a veil, and key to the ceremony is that her father escorts her down the aisle of the church to the altar where he gives her away to the groom who was waiting there with the pastor to exchange rings and vows. So the traditional wedding vows in English 
um, as they were first printed in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer in 1549, um, based at this point actually on earlier ones that have been in Latin, but now uh, in the Anglican tradition, in the English tradition, these became the English versions of them, and they're still pretty um, well-known, except for the very end. So the groom says, I, so-and-so, I, my name, take thee, her name, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee mine tro my troth. <laughs> so that's I, I pledge you my allegiance, he says at the end. I plight, plight thee my troth in the original. The bride says almost exactly the same thing. I take thee to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, or poorer, in sickness and health. But then she says, to love, cherish, and to obey. <laughs> that's the difference here in them. Until death do us part according to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I give thee my troth. So, pledges allegiance and, and gives. I'm not sure what the big deal and the difference on that necessarily was, but obviously the difference in the bow, bow includes, um, otherwise mostly equal, except for uh, the pledge to obey. So, after the pastor pronounces the couple man and wife, he allows the husband to kiss the bride. The newlyweds then walk back down the aisle to a waiting vehicle, while the guests then outside throw rice at them. <laughs> there follows a reception party with even more traditions. I was mentioning my best man speeches that I've given. Um, one of these includes the groom removing the bride's garter and also the bride <coughs> throwing her bouquet to girls, ladies in waiting, younger girls who are unmarried, but who now, whoever catches it, She's, according to tradition, going to be next. So the reception, of course, is followed by a honeymoon vacation. And then after the honeymoon is over, which has become an idiom <laughs> for the end of the romance, the end of the fantasy, and, and the beginning of real life, the bulk of the lived tradition, I'm sorry, lived experience of the traditional heterosexual marriage occurs. So while, um, just to even look at how this works, while 71% of married women with children under 18 are actually in the workforce in the USA, um, nevertheless, per day, they average two more hours of housework than their husbands. And so, um, obviously, when we're doing aggregates like this, we're not condemning all people, all weddings, and we're not singling anybody out here. In other words, there are people, when you do these averages, like I said, to bring the the marriage overall average up in terms of marriage costs. Some people are having million dollar weddings. That's not what everybody's doing. So some people have absolutely, I'm sure, very equal uh, and very thoughtful and intentional uh, marriages where they are not relying on or falling back on or defaulting to traditional gender roles. But in aggregate, um, uh, on average, women with children, married with children, do an average of two more hours of housework per day uh, than their husbands. So, share of the parenting household tasks. Um, according to a 2015 survey by the Pew Research Center, when a household has two full-time working parents, which parent does the majority of each task? And this is um, as they self-report. So, um, again, this is not in the case of where there is one of the, the let's say where the mother, let's say, is a stay-at-home mom, who's therefore working, but is not working, you know, in terms of having a, a full-time profession outside of the family and so forth. In this case, this is only counting the two full-time working parents. So who does most of the disciplining of the children? Uh, the people surveyed said that by and large, majority uh, found that this job was equally shared. And when it wasn't, um, 20% are saying that the mother is actually doing the majority of the disciplining, while 17% are saying that the father did most of the disciplining. So in other words, this role is relatively equally shared, uh, but it declines from there. <laughs> so who spends the most time playing with the kids or you know, doing activities with the kids? Again, very shared equally, six, two thirds are, that are shared equally in terms of playing and so forth. But if it comes down to just one parent uh, uh, spending more of their time, 
there's 22% of the mothers are, are spending most of the time uh, doing activities with the kids, uh, whereas only 13% of the fathers are the ones spending most of the time doing activities with the kids. So who handles most of the household chores and responsibilities? So a little more than half here, or 60% almost, um, are saying that you know, that's shared pretty equally. But among those who don't, you know, are, isn't the case, now we're to 31% of these couples, even though they both have full-time jobs, 31% uh, the women, uh, the mother there is doing more of the household chores even so. And only 9% is the father doing most of the household chores. So who spends more time taking care of the children when they're sick? So in this particular activity, less than half uh, of the um, couples are reporting that that's equally shared. Only 6% are reporting that the dad does most of that uh, caring for the sick kids. And, and again, mo almost half are reporting that, well, the mom mostly takes care of the sick kids. And finally, if you're actually to the work of managing most of the children's schedules and their activities, um, only 35% report that that's equally shared. 6% again say that the father is doing the most of that. And a majority are actually admitting that uh, the mother is still uh, handling the majority, uh, most of that uh, scheduling of kids, uh, their scheduled activities. I'm sure carting them all around and all of that. And as kids have more and more of those kind of activities that you got to drive them around for, it's, a, um, I'm sure, an enormous uh, task. So this is still, unfortunately, again, like I say, this is not every couple. This is not, you know, by any means, but this is, um, you can kind of even see that they're, where the minority is and so forth. Um, but this is an aggregate uh, from a survey. So traditionally, therefore, traditional marriage is a sexist institution, and it's actually rooted in a lot more sexism than has survived and is still with us. But unfortunately, um, you know, as you, it's still unfortunately hard to uh, transcend it. So although many married couples, obviously, in the West today would really like to operate as fully equal partners, that goal still often remains aspirational, as it's unfortunately easy to fall back on traditional gender roles where the female partner is expected to do most household and parenting tasks sort of as by default. Um, so this fellow here who's parent, taking care of the kid and doing housework, uh, only, as we saw, only 6 and 9% of uh, fathers are doing that in, in couples where they are uh, both fully employed. I want to also now reflect on kind of the symbols of the traditional wedding. So despite the realities um, you know, that we have when we're kind of looking at how uh, people report how the marriage responsibilities are being shared and child rearing responsibilities, um, nevertheless, Men, for some reason, aren't the primary market in this film genre that we started out with for the dramas or the wedding love stories. Um, you know, it's this, don't have any pictures that it's very easy to find on the internet pictures of little girls uh, pining for, dreaming about their wedding day, wedding dresses, dressed up as brides even, and so forth. Whereas um, there isn't a similar tradition for little boys. Um, not waiting for their wedding day, right? So uh, this part of this whole wedding mania that exists in our um, film genres and everything like that is really focused on uh, the female demographic despite um, some of the problematic um, sexist aspects of uh, what, you know, how the wedding played out and actually the lived experience even underlying the symbolism. But if we reflect on that symbolism, uh, underlying the traditional wedding in the West, I mean, it's easy to see that the institution's roots, you know, it's easy that the roots are showing. <laughs> and, and why then, um, if we go back to those roots, it's so difficult for heterosexual couples to transcend them on average anyway. So let's begin. So the white dress <laughs> symbolizes purity, sexual virginity on the part of the woman. And while the custom of wearing a white dress is relatively a relatively late addition to the tradition, so um, it's really only a modern tradition, and then it was only became extremely popular uh, when Queen Victoria wore a white dress in her wedding, so from the Victorian era, in other words. Um, nevertheless, 
the focus um, in terms of marriage and, and, and weddings and so forth on controlling female sexuality, and that goes all the way back to ancient times and indeed to prehistory. Um, the veil as part of the get up here apparently goes back to Roman times where it was a symbol of the goddess Vesta, the goddess of the hearth and home. Um, you might remember uh, in the Roman temple of Vesta in the ancient city of Rome, uh, the priestesses were called the Vestal Virgins. And so again, there's this idea of, of purity and, and having um, warding off, you know, protecting that kind of purity. And on the other hand, also um, as paganism was very much um, concerned about all of the kind of uh, ill-omened spirits that you might be crossing, that might be you know, kind of vexing you, that might give you bad luck and or, and or curse you in some kind of a way. The veil is also apparently a protection that's meant to uh, be a ward against those kind of ill-omened spirits against you know, kind of like bad luck kind of thing. The bridal bouquet also dates back to pre-Christian times when brides uh, in Rome again may have held myrtle and rosemary branches as symbols of luck, protection, and fertility. So fertility is a big um, component of this. This has always been one of the um, central ideas, um, although not the sole idea, but one of the central ideas of marriage is obviously regulating um, and the production, you know, having children and also uh, rearing children. Um, and one of the uh, questions that continues to be the case is whether or not um, people will be able to actually uh, conceive and have children and bear children. And obviously, prior to all of the more remarkable fertility uh, medical treatments and things like that, that uh, gives people a lot more options, that you know, wasn't the case in the past, where essentially you needed, um, as in paganism and other ways, you needed to have various kinds of um, incantations or superstitions in order to promote fertility. So one of these um, that is actually from the East, an Eastern tradition, is throwing rice. So rice is a symbol of abundance and fertility. Um, this was borrowed in modern times from uh, Eastern traditions where people throw rice at the couple as they're leaving. The bridal garter, which I talked about, that apparently dates to the 15th century Europe, and it is initially worn for luck and fertility again. However, the garter also uh, became identified with the bride's chastity, and so the gr gr groom removes the garter when her chastity ends and the marriage is consummated. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty obvious symbol, <laughs> and it, I think it continues. I've always felt it, it's a little fairly lurid for a family event the way uh, in a traditional reception, but I guess this is when, you know, Maybe the kids have gone to bed <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, the groom seemingly takes the garter and throws it uh, to his friends as kind of a trophy of a conquest. It's very different. Again, there's two different gender roles in the traditional wedding and the symbolism between what the groom is doing and what the bride is doing. The bride you know, throws her bouquet to the uh, unmarried girls who want to... Um, follow in, in her footsteps in this way and it's get and become married in that same way. Whereas, I mean, it's a little more what the groom and his friends are doing is, I don't know, more, you know, a lot less pure. And there's certainly, I think it comes as no surprise, like I say here, that the traditional ceremony really lacks major symbols indicating the groom's chastity, for example. That's not what the importance is. It's about controlling women's sexuality um, in the tradition anyway. The involvement of the church. So the tradition of having the ceremony at a church officiated by clergy, obviously that symbolically gives the marriage legitimacy by having it done in God's name. And I think uh, just as importantly, that has the effect of delegitimizing all other sexual relationships. In other words, the church is sanctioning this one and so it's saying all the other ones are not, are not legitimate. Um, however, the church it was actually a relative latecomer to the marriage business. So as of 
the Middle Ages, um, the Christian church recognized, um, the central Middle Ages, they recognized marriage as a sacrament. Nevertheless, most marriages, even at that point, did not take place in a church. They didn't require a priest. And indeed, the same canon law from that Middle Ages simply required the two parties to declare themselves as husband and wife. They didn't even actually have to have witnesses in order to make that a legal marriage as far as the church was concerned. And so actually, um, for the majority of time, including both back in pagan Roman times and then all the way up through the Middle Ages in the Christendom, um, you know, this is a marriage is primarily a, a family affair, a, an alliance between two families, essentially, where the, um, the, the scions of each house, or, you know, in, in the case of peasants, the uh, children of each of each peasant family are marrying one another, and usually um, with family consent and um, and permission and so forth, and maybe even arranging. Um, but actually, at a certain point, the the church's law kind of just allows, uh, if they are of married marrying age, um, the the two are allowed to essentially declare that they're married to each other. And that it, that's all it takes. In other words, they don't have to run to a priest like Romeo and Juliet do uh, in the in their nobles, and that's why. And it's also that's taking place late. That's Shakespeare's time, right? So um, by that time, now the church is becoming more and more involved. The church certainly is interested in marriage in in history. It's actually more was more interested in divorce, which it was trying to not have. <laughs> so. Uh, Jesus has teachings against divorce, and so therefore um, the church was pretty sticklery about that. And um, the other thing that the church was continuously trying to outlaw was um, cousin marriage. So obviously marrying siblings, of course, um, but uncles and, and aunts and things, so on. And then also, though, you know, degrees of consanguinity. So actually, you had to marry fairly far outside in order to um, be legal in the uh, church's canon law, which caused a lot more um, positive genetic mixing, apparently, than would have happened otherwise. So some, the church wasn't having an influence and, and having, um, you know, doing legal things about marriage. But on the other hand, it wasn't, um, it didn't feel like, it, first, for one thing, it didn't have enough parish priests to go around and marry all people in common. Uh, who are the commoners and everything like that, didn't have enough churches or, or anything like that. And so it's only um, more recently, and especially for poorer and poorer people, for them to actually bring the weddings into the churches has been a much more uh, recent and modern time. So besides all that, though, perhaps you know, I think the most egregious traditional symbolism is essentially the symbolic transfer of ownership of the bride from her father, who takes her uh, down the aisle and takes her to the groom and literally gives her away, or not literally, or nominally, uh, figuratively, but in what it's called, to him, to the groom. And um, you know, part of that tradition, as, as she then vows to obey her husband, her own name, her identity itself, her name, is changed. She replaces her father's family name with the the groom's family name in um, the real formal tradition in the English-speaking world. You know, in, uh, if she's marrying somebody named Brad Johnson, she becomes, you know, Mrs. Brad Johnson, you know, and, that, and so she's even known um, by his name entirely just with the, with the Mrs. in front of it and so forth. So uh, it's pretty, all of that symbolism and so much of it remains, um, is pretty stark in terms of the roots. And it's no accident. So in the time of the Roman Republic, um, most marriages were of a type called manus cum manu, which means essentially uh, that the father gives his daughter to uh, the husband, uh, who assumes then legal authority over her. And one of this uh, varieties of manus marriage was called the coemptio, and during the coemptio, there is kind of an acting and out of the ritual. The marriage ritual is the woman is notionally or fictitiously sold to the husband. So they have a person that is um, like the, the um, person that weighs the, the goods and holds some scales up and is like, 
uh, weighing the price of the bride uh, in, you know, as if they were selling a commodity in the market. Um, they're not really doing it, but they're doing uh, the symbolism of it. Um, and so um, that's where that, <laughs> this you know, tradition is very long rooted uh, all the way back into antiquity. And it continued until much very recently. So a wife's complete legal subordination to her husband remained a principle of English common law all the way up into the Victorian era. So under the principle called coverture, upon her marriage, a woman's legal rights and legal existence were subsumed by those of her husband. And so as a result of that, she wouldn't be able to enter into like a legal contract in her own name. It's something that her husband would have to conduct the contract because she doesn't have a separate legal identity other than him. He's the identity and she's subsumed uh, in it. So <laughs> those are all very unpleasant roots for uh, what I've been uncovering here for something that uh, has a lot of fun romantic comedies about it, and a lot of a lot of romance, a lot of fairy tales, and so forth. Um, so, how do uh, we transcend that? How do we reform the institution? So, for a lot of people, the solution to reforming marriage in the West increasingly has been abandoning the institution uh, with all of its baggage. So, um, like I said, one of the purposes, traditionally or historically, in marriage was creating a uh, new family unit in which to have and uh, raise children. And yet now we're to a time in the West, especially in Europe, this is, is the, where this, is, this trend is in the highest uh, places, where extramarital births are a majority of all births. So of all new kids born in 2018 in Iceland, 65% are to um, parents who are either uh, cohabitating couples, people in some other kind of non-marital relationship, or single parents. So all the kids are in 65%, only 35% are to a married couple. So in France, that's 60%, Bulgaria 59, Slovenia 58, Portugal 56, Sweden 55, Denmark 54, along with Estonia, and the Netherlands 52. So um, it's pretty remarkable, actually, and how rapidly um, that has happened. So in other words, how rapidly a younger generation has um, abandoned uh, this tradition, and perhaps we can kind of see why, as I, I even have gone through some of the baggage of it and so forth. Um, so that's one choice, and that's certainly one that um, people will continue to do. So I want to look a little bit um, within the context of my own church here and look at our history, and indeed our little problematic history with marriage. So marriage um, is recognized as one of eight rituals that we in Community of Christ set, up, set apart as sacraments of the church. There is our blessing of children, baptism, confirmation, communion, the Lord's Supper, administration, or laying on of hands to support and heal uh, people who are ill and spiritual in spiritual need, the evangelist blessing that is... Uh, uh, advice and counsel to a person at a, at a uh, change, changing moment in life, transition in life, ordination to priesthood, and like I say, marriage. Um, Community of Christ published its original policies about marriage back in 1835 in a document that was canonized as section 111 of our book of Doctrine and Covenants. Um, verse 4b is actually kind of telling, and it um, and I'll remind you of, of what the Restoration Movement is most famous for. And so this is already way back in 1835, the, the people of the church wrote, inasmuch as this Church of Christ, which was the original name of the church, has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy. So in other words, there's already, this word polygamy is already reared and people are already saying, um, uh, you Mormons are, are having polygamy and so on. Uh, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in the case of death, when either is at liberty to marry again. So monogamy, serial monogamy, uh, that you can, you can be, sorry, serial, you know, so you can 
have multiple spouses, but it's only when, when people are dying. For C, I just included this because it's actually reminded me of the, uh, the coverture idea. It's not right to persuade a woman to be baptized contrary to the will of her husband, neither is it lawful to influence her to leave her husband. So, so this idea here is even, even here in the law of the church in 1835, um, the woman isn't having a separate legal existence. If her husband forbids her to be baptized, she can't even be baptized and become a member of the church, right? So probably, probably another thing that needs to be looked at as in terms of we don't, we, don't really, um, we don't really follow all of the old scriptures. We have a different ways of interpreting scripture. So all of our scripture is meant to, to, be, uh, to understand its um, limitations of its time and place and has to be interpreted uh, in ways that are update, up to date with the living church, right? And so, but nevertheless, this is the way it's written into the text. So, despite that um, professed marriage policy, the church continued to be reproached with the crime of polygamy because church founder Joseph Smith Jr. was practicing it in secret. Um, I've had in it, this is a thing that not everybody in the church uh, has believed uh, because they because of the church's apologetics to the contrary in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, however, all historians conclusively agree um, there's a total historical consensus that Joseph Smith is the uh, originator of Mormon uh, polygamy and that he was practicing it in secret. I have a whole lecture on that from earlier this year. So ultimately, uh, Joseph Smith married about 30 girls and women in addition to his legal wife. So these were not legal marriages, but he called them marriages and called, told the girls and the women that they were marriages, including, as I've mentioned before, um, the 14-year-old daughter of my great-great-great-great-grandparents, um, Stephen and Nancy Winchester. So, and we've also said this is an abuse of priesthood authority that we do not condone <laughs> in any way, and in fact, we condemn that behavior. After his death, Many Latter-day Saint tradition churches began to publicly practice polygamy, including the large Utah LDS church uh, under the leadership of Brigham Young. So while polygyny, which is the kind of polygamy where a man, a single man, is enabled or allowed to marry multiple women, so that wasn't practiced by the Greeks and Romans, which is why it isn't really part of this Western tradition that we've been talking about. It is a part of traditional marriage in many, many other ancient cultures, and it continues to be a part of traditional marriage to this day in many other non-Western cultures. So polygyny exacerbates the sexism that's already in marriage. So I've already gone through and shown uh, the degree to which traditional monogamous marriage in the West has been horribly sexist and continues, unfortunately, to not transcend that. Uh, as well as we'd like. Um, polygyny, if anything, exacerbates it. So part of the thing that happens is um, societies actually do produce about equal numbers of males and females. And so you might think, well, if you start um, <laughs> marrying uh, lots and lots of women to you know, one man, that's gonna mathematically run you into a real problem because it's gonna mean, presumably, um, uh, as you initially would think, that some of the men aren't getting married because some of the men are getting, you know, way more women, right? Um, but actually, it's not usually how it works. Now, in some cases, when it becomes, um, when it's not stable, um, like for example, in the in the fundamentalist FLDS church, um, which is a fundamentalist Mormon group, uh, you know, it's more recently um, there have been, you know, so many the the the, pay, the leaders of those churches have taken so many underage brides and so forth that, that it does actually cause them to run out of uh, women for other men to marry and so forth. Normally, you know, that, that kind of thing is, does, isn't happening. If it's, a, it's an institution that's stabilized over thousands of years, um, that's not how it works largely. And, even, and this is even true in the institution of Utah polygamy in the 19th century. So what actually happens um, is that the marrying age for women, or actually now we're gonna say girls, goes down on average. So girls are now gonna be getting married more likely at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and so forth. 
Um, whereas the marrying age for low status men, so men who are not, let's say, in the case of the 19th century Mormon church, they're not bishops, they're not apostles and so forth, um, or, or specifically they're also not rich. And that's also true, say, in Islam or in, uh, in, in other places, of traditional um, cultures where, uh, where there's polygamy. So what ends up happening is that the low status or the poor, poor men poor, with less resources, their marrying age goes up. Doesn't mean that they never marry, but they might not marry until you know they're forty or you know or, or so. And at and at low and life expectancy is low, so in any event, they're not going to necessarily spend too many years married. And that's also going to be true for a lot of these high status men as they're getting to the end of their life and they have they have twenty wives or something like that. So, but then at that point, if you're getting married as a as a seventy year old to some teenage girls and so forth, you're not going to you're not going to live that long compared to them, probably, right? And so what will happen is they will have multiple husbands over the course of their life as they become widows and get remarried to somebody else and so forth. And so that's essentially how it happens. But it makes the relationship especially unequal. So if, you know, like I say, a kind of a grizzled 70-year-old patriarch is marrying a teenage girl, they are not, they're not of the same generation, they're not relating to each other in a kind of a equal partnership relationship. If anything, it is more like a um, anyway a, a grandfather or a father-child relationship. And so, essentially, the women in these relationships are um, infantilized. And this is one of the reasons why um, religious polygyny, anyway, um, continues uh, continues to be against. Uh, the Canadian Charter of Human Freedoms. So, uh, many Latter day Saints were critical of the practice of Mormon polygyny, and Joseph Smith's widow, Emma, and her sons were, in fact, leading opponents. They gathered into the church. Uh, which is then the, called the reorganization or the new organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but is now named Community of Christ. And they spent much of the 19th and 20th centuries denouncing polygyny. Um, and that opposition was so pronounced and it was so key to who the church was, uh, in the same way that promoting polygamy was so key to who the Utah church was, that... Uh, opposition to polygyny is effectively writing, writing that feeling into Community of Christ's DNA. And I would argue that the, um, the, the promoting of the polygamy uh, and the exacerbation of the sexism and, and therefore of sexism in general was written into the DNA of the LDS Church, which uh, has still been unable to transcend that at all. So. The Utah church was forced to abandon polygyny between the years of 1890 and 1933. They pretended to abandon it in 1890, but only slowly actually did it. And so by 1933, they were serious and had really um, uh, decided that they were against polygamy. And subsequently, um, the LDS church has actually become a very uh, vocal opponent of the practice. And in fact, because uh, even teaching the history of uh, the polygamous past has pretty much been purged out of the LDS church, there's all kinds of Mormons who were completely in the dark. They had no idea that Joseph Smith had been a polygamist. In other words, that, that idea that they were um, so strongly promoting in the 19th century um, because it became essentially suppressed information is something that the positions suddenly reversed between the two churches. And many, um, let's say, LDS Mormons to this day are really uh, less aware of the extent of the polygamy in the background in their church and so forth. Um, meanwhile, as fundamentalist Mormons who have left the mainline LDS church uh, continue to practice polygamy, the mainline church then um, persecutes and discriminates against uh, them. And so that's one of the ironic reversals. 
Um, but another ironic reversal on the whole polygyny thing is as the LDS Church, the Utah Church, and as Community of Christ expanded internationally in the 1960s into, for example, India and Africa, places where traditional marriage has included polygyny, the two churches adopted very different policies about baptizing people who were already in polygynous marriages. And so, for example, the LDS Church's policy required that people in polygynous marriages in India and Africa and so forth, they needed to renounce their extra spouses in order to be baptized. So this effectively broke up families, uh, if they wanted to join the church anyway, forcing men to abandon wives and children um, who then become essentially outcasts and, and so therefore are, are struggling so much more financially. Um, so we're resulting in a lot of injustice, whatever um, one thinks about uh, religious polygyny. By contrast, uh, Community of Christ, great opponents of religious polygyny, um, the policy that was affirmed uh, in the 1970s is that people in polygynous marriages could be baptized uh, without breaking up their families, uh, as long as they committed that they were not going to have any more marriages. So unless, unless everybody dies. <laughs> so you know what I mean? But in other words, if you're down to, um, you can only n n not have any new wives, <laughs> essentially, uh, if you're going to be in membership. Um, I mean, w. Wallace Smith, who was the prophet and president of the church, brought that council to the church, which was canonized in 1972 as Community of Christ Doctrine and Covenants 150. And so that was a, uh, although the wording of the document um, kind of obscured what was actually happening, uh, as is so often the case, what that actually provided for was a more tolerant position as people who were polygynous uh, are not denied baptism, uh, unlike, again, in the, ironically, in the LDS Church. There's further irony and diverging paths between the two churches. Given its polygynous history, the LDS Church has uh, been an ironic campaigner in favor of traditional marriage, and so the church had, uh, has been a major opponent of uh, gay rights propositions, funding and campaigning for them, against them, and so forth. Just a general a opponent of human rights. And so uh, kind of famously, uh, the Mormons helped uh, pass Proposition 8 in California, which um, prevented gay marriage, at least until, you know, the, um, until U.S. law changed in general. And there's a bunch of Mormon protesters at the time um, calling marriage one man, one woman, <laughs> Again, ironically, from a church that where almost all of the people are descended from polygamists. Meanwhile, uh, Community of Christ, DNC 164, in 2010, paved the way for marriage equality uh, in Community of Christ, at least in different church jurisdictions that uh, have conferences and vote and vote to become inclusive. So as a result of that, we had a national conference here in Canada, and since 2012 or 13, um, uh, marriages between same-sex couples are celebrated as a sacrament in the church here, uh, just as any other marriages. And indeed, like I say, the majority of the marriages that I've actually helped perform um, have actually been same-sex uh, weddings, although that's, not, that's just based on who has asked me. Yet there's still a lot of work left to do in Community of Christ. Despite the progress, um, we have been hampered, I think, by our historic opposition to religious polygyny. The fact that that has been so central to our identity um, continues to cloud, I think, our understanding of marriage. And it's also left us with vestigial policies that are out of alignment with our principles today in the 21st century. Um, and so these involve, for example, our principles about marriage and about who we can ordain, which people we can ordain to priesthood. So one of the so quirky examples, so I mentioned how we are able to have um, uh, um, same-sex marriages. Um, so if you are ordaining somebody to priesthood and they are 
uh, a lesbian and she is in a loving, committed relationship with her partner, um, that's wonderful. We love that relationship. And yet, if they are, are living together and they are not, and they're committed to each other and everything like that, but they are not actually, have not actually gotten married, so let's say they're just in Canada here and their marriage is recognized by the state as common law marriage, but it hasn't actually, there hasn't actually gone through and got a legal marriage. It doesn't even have to be a sacramental marriage. It can just be going to city hall or something like that. If they haven't gone and done that. Our uh, policy prevents us from being able to call her to priesthood. And so that's just, again, like I say, this one of these vestigial policies that's out of alignment of our principles. And I think it also um, ends up making us uh, delegitimize and look down on people in wonderful committed relationships. Um, people who have, for whatever reason, um, decided that they don't want to follow this tradition, this tradition which, as we've kind of explored the roots of, is rooted in, you know, really pretty horrible sexism that, yeah, hopefully um, we've tried to transcend, but are still struggling with, right? So, how is this going to be reformed as we're going forward? So whether we're not talking about the church or just society in general, you know, as we seek to reform marriage, you know, we have to be mindful, this is for the church actually, we have to be mindful that the most common sin associated with marriage has nothing to do with sex, but actually with sexism. And I think as a church, we have to be especially aware, aware of that because churches have been as I talked about in a lecture a couple weeks ago, um, so sex-obsessed and so uh, feeling uh, that, like, as if that policing social norms um, was anything to do with the church's, actually the church's central calling. And so we need to get past that and be especially aware of it because churches are so guilty of that and need to repent of that. Um, I think we can affirm without delegitimizing. So I'm a big proponent of marriage. I am married. I perform marriages. I think marriage is good. But in order for marriage to be good, it doesn't mean we have to say all other relationships are bad or stigmatize them or call them inferior or something like that. There are all kinds of unmarried partnerships that are also good. There are all kinds of wonderful relationships that are good. And by the way, being single is also good. People can decide to live fully meaningful lives as a single person who doesn't feel need or call or find the person that they feel uh, uh, the desire to marry and, and they can have children without a partner. And again, married partners can also not want to have children. I'm married without children. So, in order to uphold and affirm marriage as an optional sacrament of the church, I don't think we're required to denigrate and delegitimize all other relationships. And so again, for the church, I think we have to overcome the bigotry that we've inherited, that I think is inherited because of our historic opposition to Mormon polygyny. As humans generally now, if we can go back to the overall topic, and thank you for um, allowing me to have a digression and talk about my own church and so forth. <laughs> We've inherited everything from the past. This is kind of what the overall um, idea of all of these lectures is, right? So we do a lot of stuff um, in our lives, in our society, and we don't always reflect on its origins. We don't always even think, why are we doing those things? We just do them because our parents did them or other people around us are doing them and so on. And it turns out that, again, these are inheritances and the origins of them are often very problematic. And, um, and when we do that uh, reflection, when we continually learn and grow, when we have things like the exploration that we do commit our time to lifelong learning as we're doing in this group in our lecture series, we then, our next step is to reflect on how things, some traditions maybe should just be discarded because they're problematic. And maybe that's true for a lot of people for marriage. But it's also possible that they can also be creatively improved. Um, like I say, the wedding um, that I went to and helped officiate at last month was a wonderful example of one that um, was very much free of 
a lot of these problematic <laughs> traditions and uh, was so filled with, you know, love and joy and uh, just amazing, well, amazing diversity in all kinds of different ways. And so it was really quite a wonderful experience. So I think it's possible uh, on the one hand to have continuity with things in heritage while understanding that um, we don't need to be uh, beholden to hidebound practices and traditions, especially uh, ones that obviously have very problematic symbolism. And so there was not a complete history on marriage by any means, <laughs> but it was sort of my musings on uh, the problems of traditional marriage and weddings especially, I guess, in the Western tradition. My picture here now I can come back to is actually the wedding of Queen Victoria, and she is there with Prince Albert, and uh, she's popularizing white wedding dresses in that very moment. Uh, and that obviously took off and became a tradition. For some reason, grooms wearing white stockings like that did not take off, and that's pretty good. Yeah, Landra, Landra's voting for uh, that. So anyway, um, <laughs> we'll see if that becomes a tradition. So thank you so much. Now we can I'll get a glass of water, and maybe Landro will see if you folks have had uh, oh, comments <laughs> and questions. Okay. So, Bob, Bob Paxton asks, the Bible, like the Constitution, is a living document and is subject to interpretation, question mark. Um, so yes, I would say that answer is correct. So we definitely have to, I mean, if, if, it's, not, if it's not a living document, um, the church is worshiping dead text. And so I think, yeah, there's a lot of um, religions and Christians even who um, do want to, uh, you know, be literalists. They want to be scriptural authoritarians. They want to dominate people with their interpretation of scripture, which they don't even realize is, is a brand new way to interpret scripture. Um, so that, but nevertheless, and they think it's traditional, um, but in point of fact, actually, like we even said here with white wedding dresses, which are, you might think that goes all the way back, but here it doesn't. So we don't, we're often not aware of what's traditional or not. You read, um, you read text, you don't know the context for the text, your interpretation of it is as alive whether you know it or not. Um, and so, yes, uh, when there's a, um, uh, a constitution, it, has to, it has, requires interpretation. Um, the way that works right now in the... Uh, in the United States is that the Supreme Court has actually uh, taken unprecedented power over interpreting the Constitution and even writing laws, essentially, um, which is not part of the vision of the original Constitution, but just shows how um, things evolve. Um, likewise, again, the, the Bible, if, uh, again, as part of a living church, is going to be then subject to interpretation uh, regardless of whether somebody thinks that it's changed, the interpretation is changing or not. Thank you, Bob, for your support. Um, Wednesday Jones asks, in the scope of the world church, how would you suggest um, being more open to relationships like unmarried ones and even polyamorous ones without promoting religious polygyny? Um, so yeah, I think that we could just change our, um, our priesthood policy. So we have what's called the priesthood cohabitation policy. That was the one that I was talking about. That could simply be rescinded. There's no, um, there's no uh, reason to have that. And once that was rescinded, we would not need to... That doesn't promote religious polygyny. Um, you know, so we don't need a, a general... Um, zero tolerance policy in order to, um, um, to worry about the excesses of religious polygyny. You know, that means if you have a, you can on a case by case basis, if somebody is, is involved in one of the abuses that occur with that, let's say having underage marriages, then that person, that case can be dealt with, right? You don't need a, um, a zero tolerance policy in order to um, judge everything on a case per case basis like we do for everything else. Um, so we did that with, uh, with alcohol consumption. We used to have a, um, a zero tolerance policy uh, for priesthood members to uh, drink alcohol in public. It wasn't using alcohol or whatever, but it was the, 
That was the policy. Um, uh, but that we were just rescinded that, and that doesn't mean we're promoting um, alcoholism. Uh, it just means that we are operating like everything else on principles rather than having uh, a couple vestigial zero tolerance policies that are keeping us out of our principles. Daryl Scott, thank you so much for your support. Daryl asks, um, what, does I, what do I think the institutional marriage will look like in 100 years? Oh, man. <laughs> so I think I said in other places that, um, that 100 years is too, too far for historians to be able to um, uh, predict the future. <laughs> so, because the way historians um, uh, predict the future is by looking at the trends in the recent past. And unfortunately, um, trends, trends can change uh, you know, over too much in 100 years in order to um, make an accurate prediction. You can maybe only look you know, the trend lines, and you know, we can kind of draw the lines and we'll see 20 years from now maybe, or even 40 years from now while the generations that are around are around. And we'll probably see, well, marriage is going to continue to um, you know, decline, uh, certainly in the West, for a while because the numbers are rising pretty rapidly. Um, uh, and so there will be, um, but where will we be in 100 years? <laughs> you know, um, I think that people are, uh, are going to continue to be more open to um, be in kind of the individual, how they're individually deciding they want to live and live their lives without um, this kind of social expectations that in the past had been entirely the norm. Um, so, so I, I, I think that that's probably, that trend will continue as far as you can kind of see into the future. And so, but, but whether or not, you know, those lines keep going, you don't know. So um, a lot of times people think, things were always just way more conservative in the past, but actually a lot of our taboos in the West about um, especially nudism, especially, or nudity especially, uh, but, but even sex, that those really um, go more and more traditional conservative, what we think of is that, you know, going back to the Victorian era, when before that they would be, let's say, had been much more loose previously. And so actually those who are trending towards being more and more tight, more and more, um, uh, more and more taboo as the Victorian era was coming, coming upon us. And so it's only now, because we look back, we always think uh, it got so, it, we always think of the past, just we hardly remember anything before the Victorian era socially. Uh, and so we think of it as always being more and more conservative. Actually, you know, if you read uh, medieval literature like, uh, the Canterbury Tales or something like that, there is a lot of body nudism and sex out of marriage and all of these kind of things. So I don't think in general um, it didn't have any kind of like that nudity taboo of that level, the Victorian level in the Middle Ages. So um, I think that, uh, so in other words, we're going in a direction now, but it could turn around. <laughs> so, so we're not entirely clear what will happen in 100 years. So Donnie Lee Gringo asks, do we know any... Oh yeah, Leon Berg, sorry. Leon says, uh, do we know any churches that have abandoned marriages as a sacramental experience? So yeah, not all, um, so not all churches, um, let's, say have, let's say, recognize sacraments. And so many, many churches actually don't um, consider marriage a sacrament because they, they have a limited number of sacraments. They might only have, they might only recognize essentially um, baptism and confirmation and communion or something like that as, as ordinances or something like that. So some, um, some churches, I think, won't have that as an actual sacrament. Um, some churches like the, uh, the Quakers don't have like any kind of uh, sacramental things. Uh, with how they get married, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I presume they probably are um, you know, ha solemnizing marriages probably with the church and things like that, but they're probably making a, a point of it not being a sacramental experience anyway, though. Um, so Paul Cleave says, did the people of Israel request marriage from God according to the Bible and later divorce? Um, so the people of Israel are already... Uh, or already have marriage before um, 
uh, any request is made in the law. So, in other words, um, you know, Moses is the one who um, brings the law down from the mountain, according to the Bible anyway, that's the traditional origin of it. Moses was already married, actually, um, I think more than one wife, um, but in any event, he had already had a wife by the time um, they have that law, and so, so, so too then all of the earlier biblical patriarchs. Um, in terms of divorce, divorce does, um, is allowed uh, you know, in the law. Um, uh, it's like I say, Jesus who turns that around uh, for Christians and has made that uh, more difficult. Um, something that people have, um, for Christians anyway, have struggled throughout history with, as we've talked about. Um, we see more? No, oh, great, guys. I appreciate you sticking with us. This is a, um, a topic, like I said, that's been on my mind. It's something, um, a lot of cases where we have something with long traditions, something that, you know, there's a lot of romantic associations with, something that we would like to be a very good thing, um, and uh, certainly something that I've celebrated with lots of uh, friends and, and family members. Nevertheless, um, it doesn't hurt to uh, intentionally look at it and think about um, how we can make it more, live up more to our ideals than perhaps it sometimes does. So thank you so much.